one out of every five students report being bullied. 13% were made fun of, called names, or insulted. They were pushed, shoved, tripped, or spit on. One in five tweens have been cyberbullied. It's a problem, and it has to stop. Welcome to Bully This, a hero's journey. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Our passion is to show kids that there is life after bullying. You'll hear from former bullies and bullying victims, and you'll hear how they made their journey from troubled youth to successful adults. Welcome to Bully This, a hero's journey. Now your hosts, Tyler Copenhaver Heath and Clifford Starks. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Bully This, A Hero's Journey. I'm Tyler. I'm Clifford. Okay, Cliff, it's another show. You ready for one? I'm ready. Let's do it. I also am going to bring up the same theme as last time, and I want to bring up a celebrity who's been bullied, and I want you to try to guess who it is. I'm going to screw this up. Let's go. Okay. (laughs) As a child, he moved from school to school. He was frequently bullied for being an outsider. Okay. Okay. He says, I was beat up in the bathrooms, in the hallway, and shoved into lockers. For the most part, this was for being the new kid. Finally, one incident even left the rapper with a serious head injury, leading his mother to sue his Michigan school district for failing to protect her child. What do you think it is, Cliff? Rapper. Um, Jay-Z. Raphael, do you know? I have no clue. It's Eminem. That was going to be my second guess, yeah. too. Crap. Yeah. So, so close. <laughs> and he was, you know, a lot of times they were moving around. He was the new kid yeah. quite often. And so that caused his bullying. So, um, like I said, we do that because we want to bring awareness to kids. And so if they see these heroes, you know, out there, including Eminem, you would never think it, you know. And so and look where it got him to. And a lot of times those people use that somehow I read over and over and over again. It's amazing. I can have celebrities for months, you know, like it's amazing how many people are celebrities have gone through this. So anyways, I want to start off with the intro. Um, What does it feel like when you enter a strange new place all alone with your friends and families, thousands of miles away? Now, what happens if the people that you feel you're similar to don't feel you're similar enough? And what happens if the people that are different from you feel you're too different? Being the new guy in a new country with a new language can be a challenge. Some people struggle to find something that they're amazing at. Some people work so hard to overcome these struggles that they actually push through from behind to the head of the race. I would like to welcome today Raphael Brazen Defada. Raphael has an amazing story of growing up in Venezuela, where he had a hard time fitting in. After this, Raphael moved to California and still found it difficult to fit in, no matter what skin color or language the people there spoke. This would be a theme for Raphael for quite some time, even in his move to Florida. But Raphael would come into his own after finding a love of writing in college. He would find his calling and use writing as a way to open doors. If being a writer isn't hard enough already, try being an amazing writer in your second language. After graduating in 2011 from Florida International University with a degree in public relations, he would go on to be an award-winning PR agent and work with major brands including Amazon, Hilton, McDonald's, Cirque du Soleil, and Sony Music. On top of his writing success, he has also found success in the entrepreneurial world. Cliff and I can understand that. Not the Mm -hmm. easiest thing. He started a family business that continues to grow and thrive. As usual, I try to get some dirt from their parents, and I was able to uh, to get an email from uh, Raphael's mom and dad. Uh, So I'm going to let you have it here. While his classmates played at school, he would sell school supplies to other kids in the local cafeteria. Supplies that he had negotiated to buy at a wholesale cost from a local store. He always demonstrated and continues to demonstrate his ability to solve problems independently. In fact, at only 16 years old, he took on the challenge to venture to the U.S. alone on a Rotary International Exchange program and excelled to the point of having been accepted at all universities he applied. Raphael lives his life intensely in his own way and enjoys it as much as he can. We are extremely grateful 
to life for giving us the joy of being the parents, his parents, and of course, extremely proud of Raphael. What I find so great about Raphael's story is he used that thing that didn't allow him to blend in. He used it as motivation to do exactly what many people thought he couldn't do. And that's right in English. But I guess it's better if Raphael tells it. So welcome, Raphael, to the show today. That is you, awesome, Tyler. Raphael. Good stuff. Yeah, I know. super, super cool story. So the way we, uh, Bully This uh, Hero's Journey works is we're going to walk you through your hero's journey. And that starts at the beginning. And so I'd like you to tell us a little bit about Venezuela and what happened there and the move and feeling different when you moved to California, if you would. Sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, like you said, I was born in and raised in Venezuela. <clears throat> uh, we were in a in a nice city up in the northeastern side of the country, so beach town almost. Um, and, you know, my whole life, I was very sheltered. I mean, typical, uh, like my mom was an immigrant and my dad was the, the son of immigrants. So, wow. it, it, you know, then when, when I come here and I'm an immigrant, it's like a triple immigration story. <laughs> <laughs> but you know venezuela was a country of immigrants very similar to how the u.s started so sure. you have the italians the portuguese the spaniards and then the the more like second or third generation venezuelans uh you have from other latin american countries and you know it, it was a nice community we didn't really have a lot of um i guess bullying like in that sense in the in, in the community itself but then you know as globalization starts influencing how the schools operate, how people operate. It just made it, made it clearer when you were different. So yeah. for example, you know, it's a Latin country, you know, the macho mentality. It's like, yeah. you have to have, you have to be into sports. You have to play sports. You have to, you, you know, walk like a certain way. It's just, you know, <laughs> when you are, more you know like you're more sheltered like you're more business oriented or a bookworm or you know like a nerd yeah. in, some, in some cases i guess they would single you out so in my case all throughout middle school even parts of elementary school i was teased and you know they would call me names it never got to the point that was physical because i i thank my dad for that he was a lawyer and i would always joke it's like if you touch me my dad would sue you <laughs> <laughs> but um you know but but in reality it's like a lot of these kids they knew me and they knew my family my family knew them like my dad would know the other kids dad and like we went to a school that the granddaughter of the principal and owner of the school was in my class so it's like it's that really community uh centered kind of school so yeah. for us to for me to experience someone kind of singling me out or making fun of me for the way that I was tying my shoelaces, that was really traumatic at a moment because I was like, I felt so safe all the time. But then we yeah. got to that point that we, we were crossing from middle school to high school and then the differences were more stark. It's like, oh, you can't grow a beard. Oh, you have no body hair yet. Why are you, when you're changing, you have no, like, no hairs in your chest it's like yeah. people were teasing other kids for that. It's like you're 13 years old. If you're growing a mustache, that's that's you are the weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> like if you have a full on beard at 13, that, that's not <laughs> normal. <laughs> so, but again, being having that mentality, that that macho mentality. It's like oh, we're Latinos. We're like you know this big strong man, and then the girls they would get teased when they wanted to play sports. So like you mentioned, I, w I negotiated with a local supply store to buy like Hello Kitty and Sanrio, uh, like little erasers and pencils and notebooks, all of those things. Because I knew the girls, they were not playing sports. They would just stay in, yeah. the, in the library or in the cafeteria. And I started selling them the supplies. It's like every time they would get a new shipment, like I would go to the store. I would buy all of these things with my own money that I would get from my, from my allowance. And then I would sell it to the girls. For you. And he was, yeah. And then I would give it, I would, I would start getting teased because the, like my, my friends would come and say, Oh, why don't you play soccer with us? It's like, well, I mean, I don't, I'm selling stuff. I have a business. Well, you're getting that money. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm like a 10 year old, like with a business in school. <laughs> but, um, awesome. 
yeah, so that that's how it started. And then, you know, the upperclassmen are like, I want I want to single out the, the class that was right one like one year above us. Like if we were in sixth grade, the seventh graders, that class yeah. had like this group of five guys. They were the ones who brought bullying to our school. They would bully up and down the classes. Like they would wow. bully the eighth graders and the ninth graders wow. and the seniors. It's just because they were taller. They were abnormally large. Um, yeah. And then, you know, they would start bullying people in my class. And then the kids in my class started calling each other names. It's like, to me, I guess, I was one of the first ones to kind of bring it up during a class. Like, we were doing, like, a... We used to do a lot of kumbaya. I don't know. Can we curse in this podcast? I don't know. Uh, well, we were doing a lot of kumbaya things. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we were sharing our, um, our our thoughts of, like, what how did this year go? Like, the after, at the end of the school year. And I brought it up. It's like, we've been studying together since second level of kindergarten. Like, you've known me since I was two or three years old. And now that we're 12, you're going to call me names for things wow. that you know I do. That was insightful of you at that age. Right. I, I guess I need to thank my parents for that. They yeah. really always pushed me to think about, like, beyond just, like, video games and my classes and my friends. Yeah. And when I brought that up is when, when he kind of shook our class. And, you know, we, we realized, like, what are we doing? Like, if, if I've known you for more than, like, I've known you for longer than anybody else that I know in my life. We've been yeah. in the classrooms together. We've been to each other's, you know, birthday parties. And now I'm bullying you? So yeah. at least that kind of put a stop into, like, the, the people in my class. We we started kind of looking out for each other and protecting ourselves from this little group of five bullies from the class, from the next class. Well, um, whether you know it or not, you actually, we just had a therapist on the show and she says that's one of the key components is, is kind of redirecting and saying, this is how you're making me feel, you know? And when people have a chance to redirect and think, okay, I didn't realize this, or I didn't think quick enough. It's actually genius that you were able to, to think like that at such a young age. And I applaud you because it seems to be a good impact on the system. And obviously it worked firsthand. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess, you know, we had a, a psychologist. It was a typical private school in South America. We had a psychologist, and she would talk to all of us at least once a year. And Ooh. it seems like a lot of these kids from my class, they didn't notice. But why? We had 30 students in the class. 15 were guys and 15 were girls. The girls, okay. they were all in their own world. They were all fine. From the 15 yeah. guys, only three, including me, were experiencing this type of bullying. And at the Got time, it. bullying wasn't a thing. This is the 90s. Like, you would yeah. just be like, oh, you're, you're not normal, or you're just being teased, or they're just playing. Uh -huh. But it's bullying, inherently yeah. bullying. So sure. It, it was just the That's three of us. That's a great us. point, too. Right. So, and, and again, it's in Latin America. To this point, there's bullying happening there. There's yeah. so many issues in society there. I mean, there's racism, discrimination, gender discrimination, uh, queer, you know, discrimination. There's so many and bullying and all of this is being overlooked. It's yeah. specifically in South America. Um, so for us three to kind of realize that we were being singled out, I, I didn't like it, to be honest. Um, no. My other friend, he did get beat up once because they were, you know, they were teasing him for not playing soccer during recess and he went to yeah. play the next time and he was terrible <laughs> he was so bad <laughs> they made him the goalie uh -huh. right so they put him they, he played goalie and they started just kicking more than one ball at him at yeah. the goal and he got hurt and then after that because he was in the team with these five bullies from the next class and after school, they beat him up because they lost because of him. And that oh. was the first time that I saw that they got physical. And so they forced him to play. And then when he didn't play up to their caliber, they used it against him. Right. So it's yeah. like you lose if you play, you lose if you don't play. Yeah, um, exactly. And that's that's at the precedent. And at that point, 
I noticed we were walking because the school it's it's complicated, but the school was a few blocks from a, a public uh, field, and we had to walk to the field for um, some school functions and also for uh, PE because we didn't yeah. have a big gym gym in the school. And when we got we were walking to the field, I mean we walked with two teachers, like a chaperone and the PE teacher, and they were all the way at the front. And that day I happened to stay behind. And these kids were trying, they started pushing me around. They pushed me, oh. I actually tripped and I fell and I scrapped my knee to us. I have a scar to this day in my knee because we were in shorts and I just scrapped, like scraped it on the um on the asphalt. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't say anything. I mean, they kept walking. When they saw that I was bleeding, they kept walking, they left me alone. I didn't tell anybody to like today that I'm telling you guys. <laughs> like I always said that I just got that in my in my moped. But yeah, you know, to me that was like what's going on like you know what, what's going on in my community what's going on with my friends like why was i just pushed and why am i bleeding um so i got scared <laughs> um i got i got i mean i got terrified and i started saying you know what i'm going to i'm going to try to get into the sports i'm going to try to play with the kids and i'm going to just try to be friends with as many people as i can and that's why i started building like a shield <laughs> with friends i realized that and I realized the power of having people around me at all times had. Like, sure. that was my superpower. Like, my dad has always been this charismatic, fun, almost crazy, rambunctious person. And I was a little bit like that. But I was like my mom. More reserved. Yeah. More of an introvert. My uh-huh. voice was lower. You know, I, I was that person that if I was talking to you in the classroom, you would lean in to listen to me. Because okay. I was my voice was like 10 decibels lower. Yeah. So I said, you know what? I need to survive. <laughs> this is not going to happen to me. And I started being more like, like my dad. Became friends with everybody. That's what I did. Just, you're a new person in school, you're going to be my friend. <laughs> you're Good. the school administrator, I'm going to be your friend. You're the wife of the guy that opens the door and like the front gate of the school, I'm going to be your friend. <laughs> So I was friends with everybody. And that was my my shield. That was my my I guess mechanism to protect myself. Cause yeah. I I also realized at that point that I don't know why I feel pain more than most people. Like a cut for me feels like a gash when it's just like a paper cut for someone else. So I said I can't like if you punch me, it hurts me more than what what it would you know, someone else. <laughs> Have you ever so, seen that show, um, Unbreakable? Unbreakable, Unbreakable. Is it about the It's girl? a movie with Bruce Willis, no. and it's got, um, who's the dude that's in, uh, um, shoot, Samuel L. Jackson. So okay. Bruce Willis is unbreakable, right? Like, he finds out he's basically this superhuman, and he can't break. And Mr. Glass is this extremely breakable guy, right? And the idea is there always has to be a yin and yang out there. Since one person is in extremely uh, extremely strong and unbreakable, and one person extremely unbreakable, and I think about this a lot, you know? And so if we have psychopaths in the world that don't care about other people's emotions, we must have the opposite side of that, which is the people that feel too much, you know, care too much, you know, they pull her opposite. I feel like that's me, you know, like, I feel like, you know, no matter what it is, I can feel it, you know, and like, I it must be more than the average human because it causes me a lot of pain. And it sounds right. like that's what you're describing, you know, the Mr. Glass yeah. to the Mr. Unbreakable. Essentially, I was Mr. Glass. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and then, and that's how, like, that... Oh, go ahead, Cliff. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, the other cool thing with uh, Mr. Unbreakable and Mr. Glass is as they were learning their superpowers, as they were learning their identities, it made sense why they showed up the way that they showed up. And I'm hearing your story. You're super solution based. Totally. Like you're always looking for the solution. Like where's the yeah. solution? Where's the solution? Where's the solution? I love that right. about you. You're actually, yeah. and uh, if you like look on the government's anti-bullying website, which we'll post a link on there too, I've been meaning to do it. You're like walking through the steps almost that they say to combat bullying. You know, a lot of it has to do with groups. A lot of it has to do with talking about, hey, I'm feeling this way about what you're doing to me and making people understand that, you know? And so 
I have friends that have been coming up to me recently and they're like, Tyler, my young kid is dealing with like a form of bullying. And I've been talking to him now instead of like stick up for yourself. Now it's like, let's talk about this. You hit me. That hurt. I didn't like that, you know, and especially if you're starting at a young age and you're coming into this group, you know, like that's growing up together. So now you're building together, you know, and you're I, it seems to me you were integral part of that, you know, because you're yeah. getting everybody on the same page. Like, let's be kind to each other. Let's enjoy our time together, you know, instead of beating each other up. Yeah. And, and you know what, that although it worked for me and I became friends with so many people, it got to the point that a few years later, I mean, I graduated, I came to the States with, you know, I went to, to California when I would travel back and my little cousin was still in school. And then we, we were like four, it was three of us mainly. And then my, my other new cousin started in the school too. Um, they were all in the school and I would go back and, you know, visit them. Cause I was, we we're like three years apart, all of us. The last one was experienced bullying and in the same school. And she was a girl. Okay. Like the girls mm-hmm. were bothering her because she was overweight. She was a bit of a tomboy. She didn't want to play with like the dolls. She wanted to actually like, you know, do exercise because she felt uncomfortable with her weight. And I noticed that these kids were bullying her. But then when I would go to school, they were scared of me. Hmm. Like her classmates and then my other cousin, the one in the middle, and then the older ones. The older ones, they knew me because they were again, we were three years apart. So we were we had more interactions. But these other kids they knew me up from my reputation that I stood yeah. up to people. I, they knew me as Rafa, like you don't mess with him, but they were scared of me when they met me in person. And that made yeah. me realize like as powerful as, you know, being this popular person, like you become this idol for some bullied kids. And yeah. then they tell the stories. They, they the stories morphed into something that was not there. Like there was a rumor going around that I paid someone to beat up my bullies outside of school. (laughs) Okay. That's one way to do it, I guess. I guess, but that didn't happen. (laughs) So it's like, they even, they said it was You were being this, the sheepdog we talk about, or the government website calls it the interrupter, you know, that third party that comes in, you know, kind of, and especially since you're older now, you're at a different position. So, right. Can can you tell us a bit about um, because I find this part really interesting. So you community is key. Right. And now what happens if you move away from your community altogether like you did? You know, you took this U.S. position, you know, and there are some people that are kind of similar to you in the U.S. You know, I I don't want to take words uh, out of your mouth, but I'd like you to tell us what it was like moving to California. What were the kids like that you found similarities with? You know, and what were the kids like that you found differences with? And how was that being so far away from your community? Right. So I came after. So I graduated in Venezuela. I, I had my my high school diploma at that point. And this exchange program was more of a I was a cultural ambassador. That's how they call us. So, huh. you know, I'm coming from, you, you know, that high, like you graduated high school and like you kind of yeah. peaked. Like you pick with friendships, you have friends and I was in the yearbook and I was a class president. I was valedictorian. Like I planned the graduation party. Awesome. Like I was in all of those little clubs in school. When How I old are to you? California, I was 16. Okay. Yeah. So I graduated a year early because I skipped a year. Okay. Um, when I get to California as a 16 year old and they place me in the school and, you know, I'm, I'm going to my first class, which I remember clearly was calculus three. I don't know what I was thinking getting into (laughs) calculus three. After a class, I just dropped out. Uh, um, But I walked into class and I just me being myself, I sat next to someone and I said, you know, hi, I'm Rafael. I'm new here. This kid just looked at me like he just looked at me with like a face of disgust and he turned around. And I'm like, all right, whatever. So wow. after the class, I'm in, cap- in the cafeteria line and I'm waiting for someone um, to, you know, to move. And I'm saying hi to kids around me because that's how we did it back at school. But my sure. God, I'm coming from a class of 30 kids. Like our graduating class was 30. And the school, yeah. it's from preschool to senior year, which is 11th grade over there. And there's 30 kids maximum per class, 25 to 30. So it was like a couple hundred kids 
and I'm going to a class that the just the junior class was like 400 kids. So thousands, thousands of teenagers in this school. And it was kind of like the movies. Like people had lockers and you had to quad and you had to run from one class to the next. It was completely different. So from from one perspe- from one point, it was fun. It was like a dream. Like, oh my God, I'm I'm, you know, I'm in one of those TV shows I used to watch on MTV. Yeah. But then I started realizing that just as cute as it was, then those a-holes <laughs> kids were a reality. Yeah. Like I'm saying hi to someone. And they, again, they look at me like, like, why are you talking to me? Like, who are you? It's like, I'm just telling you, hi, my name is Rafael. I'm new here. I yeah. just moved to the States. And you're going to look at me like with a face of disgust. Yeah. So I started feeling like I, I, that's when I realized I have no shields. I have no friends. I had no one around me for the first time in I don't know how many years. And that's when I realized, I'm like, okay, what do we do here? Like, you said, Cliff, solutions. What, what's the solution? What do I do? I realized that no matter who I talk to, they didn't want to talk to me. So I heard some people speaking Spanish and I approached them. And they kind of looked at me a little bit weird. And I heard, like, I don't know, honestly, I don't remember what I said, but I probably, I stuttered a little bit. And yeah. one of the girls asked one of her friends, basically in Spanish, what is why is this white boy talking to us in Spanish? Huh. Well. And I look at her and I'm like, wait, hi again. <laughs> Let me say yeah. my name again. I just yeah. came from Venezuela. I'm not a white boy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. what's going I on? I can't understand you. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, they kind of looked at me weird too. And they were saying, you know, like, oh, in Spanish, the whole conversation, of course, like, where am I living? Where am I coming from? When did I move here? And as soon as they heard the neighborhood I lived in, they said, oh, wait, so you came here with your parents? How how are you living there? So I gave them the whole spiel. I came, I'm a cultural ambassador. I'm coming from Venezuela. I'm with this family, whatever. They just turned around and walked away. They didn't even let me finish. Yeah. So next day, I tried the same. I tried to approach her and I said hi to her. And then she's like, look, like, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, we don't want to hang out with you. You're too white to be with us. Yeah. And I was like, I'm too white? It's like, mind you, Venezuela, we do have the different races, different classifications, different ethnicities, different nationalities. And yeah. everybody's just fine. Everybody was just fine at that point. Here's the first time that someone kind of told me, I don't want to be your friend because of the color of your skin. And that, to me, was like, that was a stark comparison to the community that I grew up in. So I said, okay, let me just go talk to the other kids. I met some kids in my choir class. They were a little nicer, but they still didn't want to like talk to me throughout the whole lunch. So I yeah. spent like three weeks alone, like eating lunch alone in like yeah. a table. And to the point that I, I started making friends with the administration, <laughs> like the lady that Sorry. was in the copy room, like the cafeteria uh-huh. lady. Like they were oh, nicer yeah. and kinder to me than the kids. And of course, I miss my parents. Like I would wake up crying every morning and go to sleep crying every night because I missed everything. Um, there were no pay phones because this this is uh oh eight, two thousand eight. Pay phones yeah. started going away at that point. Yeah. Um yeah. and I couldn't afford to call from my cell phone to my like call my mom. So we only had MSN Messenger at the point. And it was kind of like chatting and looking at each other in the little pixelated screen. Yeah. It was just rough. It was really rough. Um, but then Did you ever host- feel like you wanted to give up and go oh, yeah. back? I, yes. I packed my bag probably three times in the first month. And wow. the host mom would be like, no, no, we need to unpack. Like She would help me out unpacking. And then I would just repack that same night. And at one point, I did call my dad and I said, you need to get me the hell out of here. Buy me a ticket. Get me out of here. I told him this is hell. Yeah, I can't. I can't. And that's when I, I could hear my mom crying in the background. But my dad kept saying that she was fine. And he was he would tell me, he's like, you are a winner. You're not a loser. Whatever they're telling you, you can't believe it. It's like you are a champion. <laughs> like my dad always raised me with the mentality that I'm a freaking champion. Yeah. Um, and he told me, he said, if you come back now, how would it look? 
And I was like, okay, how would it look to who? So then that's when I, I kind of started piecing together. Rotary, the way that it operates, you have like local club presidents in each city. Like, a, you know, yeah. like the presidents were the group. But then they're connected as a district and the district has a governor. My dad was a past governor. And so he led so many presidents in a full year and they all knew me. So all their eyes were on me from yeah. Venezuela. So how would it look if I come back? Not just for me, for my dad. I know my dad didn't yeah. mean it for him, but I started thinking and say, my dad's going to look bad. I can't make my dad look bad. And I'm yeah. not going to go back with like with my tail between my legs. I'm sure. not. That's when I realized that I'm more competitive than I thought. I'm extremely competitive. <laughs> Good. It's like if you want if you want to get me to do something, give me a competition. I will beat everybody. <laughs> um, so then you know I, I talked to my host mom and she heard the whole conversation. She spoke Spanish a little bit, and she came. She hugged me and she told me, "You know what? I'm going to help you make things better." And I told her, "Look, like the worst thing you can do right now is actually do like step in and do something." But she's headstrong, and I love her. And to this day, I'm I'm still in touch with her and the host dad and the siblings. Like I visit them as much as I can. Um, oh, that's great. We're like a real family, you know. The company yeah. is part of the family. Um, she she basically dragged me half a block across the neighborhood, and she started knocking on one of her neighbor's doors, and she asked if Sam was there. Sam Putney, I remember his last name. He was a kid in my class. And he had similar interests. And she told the mom, it's like, can you tell Sam to introduce Rafa to his friends? Do something. And he introduced me to some friends. They were part of this like homecoming dance demonstration, like a class. Like, they were classes against each other's school air bands. And I said, you know what? Sure. I know how to dance. I have rhythm. <laughs> and they put me <laughs> in it. And I, that's where I became friends with probably 30 kids immediately it was immediate like I, we went on one practice the next day i went to the cafeteria as so i was walking out i remember ariel ling i remember these people's names ariel goes like rafa come over here and i said i heard my name <laughs> and i went and that's when i sat with them and it was just an incredible group of teenagers and they were just like my friends back home and all i needed was one person to vouch for me yeah. And you had, do, do you, I, I want to uh, grasp the part of your story where you're talking about the dance. So you had da dance skills yeah, already. I'm, I'm, I'm from Latin America. I have to have some. <laughs> 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 this helped you fit in immediately. And so as soon as they explored this talent that you had, which you never had a chance to showcase before, that helped you fit in. You got one foot in yeah. the door. You killed it because you could dance. You know, like I'm trying to think of an awesome word for dance. I'm just not involved in that community. You know enough about it because I'm a horrible dancer. <laughs> but no, I think that's awesome. I mean, your yeah. your story is literally almost like it should be used as a, a case study because you're literally coming through every step and you're like somehow like intuitive enough to know how to deal with these steps. You almost should be writing the rule book, you know, in a way. <laughs> And now, you know, you're in this thing and it was so hard, but you passed yeah. through it. And then all of a sudden there's light at the tunnel. So yeah. now I would assume you're starting to build a little bit, right? You're, you've got some Absolutely. friends now and okay. Yeah. I got friends. I mean, they all knew me as, you know, I, at that point I stopped caring so much about my accent because the, at the beginning, you know, those, those first few days, like some girls would be like, oh, you, you sound so stupid. You sound so uneducated. Um, they make it fun of my accent. Like, and at a point, like I remember I snapped back and I said, it's like, well, the, the reason why I have an accent is because I speak another language. You cannot even, you can barely speak English and you cannot even begin to, to, to learn another language. That's why you don't have an accent. And that started making me look like bad in front of hmm. some of the kids that heard that because okay. some of my friends say that, Hey, did you, were, did you like scream at so-and-so? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I did. But you know, so that was looked down upon, but her making fun of my accent was not, or like the Mexican kids, not like rejecting me. The, the, yeah. that, that wasn't looked back down, but but me like snapping back did. So I was like, that that's not right. That's not that's not fair. But whatever, I I digress. I I let it go. Um, well, and that's why yeah. it's almost 
Go ahead, Cliff. I actually appreciate you sharing that because uh, perception is so important in getting right. this right. And right. it's very, very easy to, to see one side and jump and say, this is what's wrong. And, and me and Tyler were just talking about the system. And in order to understand the system, you have to step back to see the whole system. Absolutely. Sometimes we get not deep enough into a system, like we talked about immersion a couple of weeks ago, you know, and that is an experience, right? But then you get somehow too much into a system and then you silo in it. And this is interesting what you're saying too, because we have a guest coming on in a couple of weeks and she was actually in a similar boat to you. You know, uh, she got into the point where she's in this defense mode and it actually changed things. I don't want to give away her story because it's incredible, but it changed things a lot. That second that she tried to stand up for herself and actually <laughs> it kind of all the cards fell loose from there. So are you, right. you're kind of saying that, you know, here are you finally standing up for yourself a little bit? You're pointing out what they're pointing out to you and they don't like their own medicine. Exactly. Um, but, you know, the, because I, I wasn't, I, I was very self-aware, as you can see. But when my friends told me that, I said, OK, you know what? I'm going to be just exactly who I was. But because they don't know who my parents are, they don't know the whole family history, my, our families don't know each other. I can just be this new version of myself. I can be yeah. a little more raunchy. I can be a little bit crazier. Like I, I, could, I could experiment and see what type, what part of my personality I can let shine a little more because I'm writing my own stories. I'm a new community. I'm with new friends. So I became like, you know, like the funny uh, exchange student with the accent, a little raunchy. Like I, I knew what I was asking sometimes, but I would ask what a bad word would be to a teacher just to make everybody else laugh. Oh. Like, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I didn't know that was the meaning of it. Yeah. Kind of like Fez did... from 70s show, huh? Yes. Exactly. That's awesome. Well, it's exactly what I was doing. (laughs) Well, uh, KJ was on a couple weeks ago, and she has KJ, and then she has Carrie. You know, and they're two different people. It sounds like you started to uh, develop Raf, or let's say, you know, as your US uh, Fez (laughs) character. (laughs) Used to call me. um, uh, Some of my friends used to call me Rafi. Which uh-huh. is a completely different name in 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 in, in Venezuela, but they were calling me Rafi, and then some of them started calling me Rafiki. From I think it's from the Lion King, Rafiki. Um, yeah, but it was kind of like a, like a term of endearment, and for them it just yeah. became like I became that funny friend that they wanted to have around, and that's how I protected myself from you know kind of get teased again from my accent and and all of that, but. You know, and I never let that affect my grades. Even though it was an exchange year and my, my grades wouldn't count for anything, I still got all straight A's except one class that I got an A minus. But <laughs> so you, everybody man. thought yeah, everybody thought that I was like this funny, friendly exchange student. He's probably not doing that great in classes, but secretly I have a three ninety five unweighted GPA. When when they weighted, because I was taking AP classes, it was like four twenty five. So it's like That's amazing. Yeah. Right. And yeah, and then and that's when I decided, you know, I can do it. I can I can make it happen here in the states. I can stay and go to college here. I don't have to go back home if if I have the opportunity. What's super cool? You're such an intellect that <laughs> you you have an ability to figure out like where to add value. Yeah, right. like you're just like okay, where do I add value? Where do they need value? Yep. Where do they see value? Uh-huh. And you're what are they missing out, here? Yeah, you're figuring out the solution. <laughs> And diving into figuring it out and putting it together, I'm like, wow, that's ingenious. <laughs> yeah. You almost made this, like, fit this mold. It's like, oh, what do they need here? What do they need? Yeah. They need the foreign guy. <laughs> not yeah. play that part. <laughs> Everybody needs one. Well, and, and how much, so it must have been that first introduction, that first friend that finally brought you into this confidence that, hey, now I can play this part, you know? Yeah. Why do you think, and I just want the kids to hear this too, because it's a lot of benefit for the kids. Why do you think that wasn't a possibility before that first introduction? Because there were so many kids, I guess I was approaching the wrong groups. I Got it. You know, some of the groups that were not the nicest. And even after I had a lot of friends, I realized that these people were just bitter. They yeah. were yeah. just not happy individuals. Either they... I knew some stories, like some kids were like from a single parent family or they like their parents were going through a divorce or some of them had domestic violence. So I felt for them at one point, 
And, sure. And, you know, I, I, I think I, I mentioned this to you before, but when I got to college, I realized, like, they're bullying or they're being mean really not because of you. Like, they weren't mean to me because of me. They just had so much anger that they had yeah. to just let it go. And if you're in the line of fire, you're going to get hit, unfortunately. Yeah. How much were you um, judging wrong? I'm kind of interested to see, you know, so you had these people like, okay, they speak Spanish. I speak Spanish. I can get into this crowd and find some belonging here. But how much were you surprised when you find, you said you kept choosing the wrong groups, you know, were the groups that were the right groups, the one that you actually get along with, like would those have perceptually like been closed off and then you meet them and then you're like, oh, wow, these are the amazing people. I thought they looked tough or I thought they looked this. Were you was that the kind of group? Was it uh, deceiving almost uh, outside appearances? Yes, <laughs> they um, So I'll start with, the I guess, my Hispanic kids. Um, they were fantastic people. Uh, they, the girl that told me, like, she was very straight up. Her name is Angelica. She approached me, like, at the end of the first, like, around Christmas. And she gave me a little, she actually, actually sent me a candy gram. And I was surprised to get it. So uh -huh. I approached her in, at the quad and I said, hey, I got this candy gram. Thank you. And then she, she apologized. She said, you know, I've seen that you've become friends with everybody. You're in air bands. You're, you were part of homecoming. You're in a choir. You're in the theater. Like you are volunteering at the cafeteria when the, when the cafeteria lady sick. Like I was, she saw me everywhere. And you want to she, yeah. And she said, you know, I'm sorry. Like if you want to hang out with us, you can. And at that point I said, like, you know, I, Add me on Facebook when Facebook was a thing. I was like, add yeah. me on Facebook, but I don't think I want to hang out with you guys. Like, I have, I have plenty of friends at this point, and yeah. you know. And then going back to the group of friends, I was intimidated the first time I met them. When Sam started walking towards them, and I'm like, no, like you, can't, you can't. It's like Not the ones. junior class president. <laughs> it's like the junior class president, the entire SGA board. Uh, it was like. Three cheerleaders, one football player. Like it's all of these like popular so kids. The cool like, kids. Yes, they were like the cool kids, and I was like, I'm gonna get eaten alive here. So like, yeah. I was never one of the cool kids, and I actually had a conversation. I'm still in touch with some friends from back in Venezuela. One of my friends, Bea, she lives here in Miami, and you know we we try to hang out as much as we can. And we make fun of people. We're like, guess how how long we've known each other? People think it's like, oh, like five years. We're like more. Like, oh, 10 years, more, 27 years. We've known each other for 27 years. It's like, it, this is hard. Yeah. And I mentioned to her how I felt that she was part of the popular and the cool kids. And I never fit in into that group. In her perception, I was part of their group. I was part of all the cool kids. I was going to all the parties. Everybody wanted to come to my birthday parties. But in my head, I was not. I was ostracized. because You didn't even know. You were in the in group and everybody's <laughs> perception except your own. Right. And that really, and, and I was talking to her. I mean, I never mentioned to her about how these five, the five kids who were actually her friends, they pushed me and, and all of these things were happening. I didn't tell her. I didn't tell anybody. But apart from what, I, it was like a sliver of what was happening, but a lot of it was in my head. So yes, I got pushed. Yes, I was called names. But a lot of that was... I was internalizing it wrong. Like I was not being bullied by everyone and I was not being ostracized by everyone in my school. It was mainly how I felt like my insecurity. I let my insecurities grow beyond what they were. And that's when I'm like, okay, like I, I it kind of clicked like 20 something yeah. years later. It clicked well, by just such, having an honest conversation. Such a good point. I mean, how often yeah. actually in, but we're kind of caged in our own head. I actually have a friend from high school and um, we weren't actually that close then. And we've gotten to be real close now. She's actually going to come on the show in a couple of weeks, but I had no idea. She was confident. She was pretty. She was so smart. I always looked at her as this incredibly smart person. She was dealing with a lot of bullying and I never knew that, you know? And so in my perception of her was smart, popular, intelligent, and she completely was miserable through high school because she was, you know, closed off. And right. you're saying kind of the same thing. It's like you were cooler than you thought you were. You were in the in group, but you had already made it up in your mind that you weren't. And so you struggled it needlessly. Exactly. 
So, and that's what I've told a lot of my a lot of kids that I've met, and I know that they've been bullied. And I tell them, it's like you need to really assess the situation. Like, look at the bigger picture, like ten thousand feet view. Yeah, you might be, you might just be blowing everything out of proportion, and you might not really be like bullied. You might just be close enough yourself. Yeah, you know what's so cool about this is uh. Tyler was talking about the hero's journey specifically, like we're going through a hero's journey and going through a process and we come out the other end completely transformed from it. Yeah. And sometimes these kids, they just need one step because perception's reality. Yeah. You know, and if it if it's feeling big to them, it's big to them in yeah. that moment. And it's like, hey, we're here. We got you. We got your back. Just reach out, reach out to someone, someone who's there for you. And you you had like these little champions throughout your process that you didn't even realize were dinging, you know, your dad, yeah. your champion, ding, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you get with a cool kid that you didn't know was a cool, uh, that thought you were a cool kid, ding. Yeah. And you, you get enough of those and the momentum starts running. And what's so crazy. I, I, I love the hero's journey. Like I'm constantly going through the hero's journey. I'm like, yeah. I'm going to find the UFC. I'm going to be a wrestler. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I want to change 1 billion lives. I'm yeah. like, and, and me and Tyler's, connection has connected even more. Now we get to hear your amazing story on how you've gone through your process and you've had your hero's journey to allow others to have theirs. Right. And, and that's why it's so important to share it. I, that's such a great point that Cliff's making too, is like, you never know when that one flip of switch, you know, you had switches in the back of your head, you know, and all of a right. sudden you started flipping them on. And then that led to more and more. And that's why what we're mostly, if you notice, we keep it really lighthearted, you know, the bullying subject here, because yeah. more so we're pulling out motivation because you don't know who's out there watching this right now. That it's going to flip that switch. They had it right. in the back of their head. They had this amazing talent, this dancing talent that everybody was going to love them for. They just didn't have a chance to showcase it yet, you know? Mm -hmm. right. So we're flipping switches right now, we hope, you know? And you never know what that switch is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Raphael, you want to tell me a little bit about now high school's out of the way. They know you as this dance phenom. They know you have Fez. You're this enduring individual, <laughs> you know? But now... You've got to venture into unknown territory once uh, unknown territory once again. You've got to go to Florida. You enrolled in college there. Can you tell us what that was like and what that growth experiment was? All right, so Florida. <laughs> I first of all, I want to throw my parents under the bus and make it public to everyone listening and watching that I got stuck in Florida because of them against my will. <laughs> <laughs> I could have easily stayed where I was in California in the Bay Area with the people that I already knew. But yeah. my parents said, oh, yeah, we're moving to Florida next year, 2010. And I'm like, all right. So I guess I'll move to Florida and go to college and then we can be reunited. And I found, yeah, like they they got me, like, you know, they found me, they, they situated me. They found a, a room that I could rent and then we bought the car and I got a scholarship and I started and then they're like, yeah, we're not moving next year. And I was like, oh, so maybe next year? Like, no, we're not going to move now. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> like, they got all the way to Florida. You're waiting with the door open for them in a floor mat that says welcome. And they're not coming. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, just, yeah, and, you know, throw them under the bus. But, um, yeah, I moved to Florida. Um, to me was, I mean, apart from the culture shock, because I was coming thinking that Florida was more like California. You know, I'm in the United States. And I'm going to come here. My accent had, I guess, like, because I came when I was 16 and I was using English every day of my life. Yeah. You know, your brain has more plasticity at that time. And your tongue can be more malleable. So I was able to reduce, reduce my accent by, like, 70% just that year in California. But I get here and I have a California accent. So the people <laughs> that I started making in college, they're looking at me like, you have two accents. <laughs> and I was like, but you have an accent. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I didn't make a lot of friends the first month. It, it only took a month because at that point I had already perfected my formula. Um, <laughs> you know, it was like it was like a month. Like everybody's still meeting each other and people didn't really want to hang out with me because some of them knew each other from high school. And the other ones knew each other or they had an instant connection because they were Cuban-American. Or the Nicaraguans would hang out together. It's like all yeah. these immigrants, first and second generation. 
And then, so I started hanging out with the Venezuelan kids. And also, oh, there were some a lot. <laughs> wow, a lot. Okay. So we started hanging out, but not from my city, they're from other sides of the country. So then that's yeah. when I was like, I had layers of like the judgment. So I had the, you know, Miamians that they were like, you don't sound like us. Then my other Latinos that they were like, you're not Latino enough again. And then I have my Venezuelans that were like, oh, you're from the East. We're from the capital. It's like always elitist. And I was, I was like, are you, are you freaking kidding me again? How am I going through this again? Yeah. So, yeah, whatever. I mean, I started meeting, like, I didn't, I, I guess I wasn't, I clicked with a few of my Venezuelan kids, but then I became a lot of, like, really, really close friends with the Cuban-American, the Nicaraguan-American, the Spaniard-Americans. Like, it was all the second-generation kids. They were already born here. They yeah. communicated, like, normally 100% in English, and but they would speak Spanish. And little by little, some of them, they taught me, like, Oh, these are the funny things that we say in the Miami twang. Oh, this is how you get the Miami accent. We say dale. We said pata sucia. We say chancleta. Like, I, they kind of like gave me a crash course <laughs> on Miami culture. Yeah, the okay. Miami culture is hilarious. So, awesome. and I, I just I just learned how to do that. But to me, it was like, I was like, I'm in college and I'm still experiencing what happened in high school. So, yeah. So, how is that even like I I didn't even think that was remotely possible. I thought it was gonna be impossible for that to happen. But like I, you know, I like me, I joined groups, I joined clubs, I joined everything. And this is Miami Dade College, it's a community college. So it was only two years. And I said after like a few months, I'm like, you know, F it. Just flip the table, throw everything at the wall. I only have two years here. If everybody hates me, they hate me. If things don't work, they don't work. As long as my grades are good and I transfer to a good college, I'm fine. Yeah. And so yeah, I started. I started joining all the clubs. I started being like I was in the um, in the language honor society, and then they're like, "Oh, who wants to be an MC for the Asian American Celebration Week?" And I'm like, "I'll do it." So I was just there with like one of my Asian <laughs> friends and reading names <laughs> in Chinese and Japanese and completely butchering them. But I was trying my best. I was trying my best. But you know, it was. It was fun for me. And that's how, again, I became that person that my dad, I became such like the charismatic one, the fun yeah. guy. Like he's smart, fun, hopefully attractive. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I used a lot of humor and I, I pulled from my past experiences to just make the best out of my time. And then I transferred to FIU where I got my bachelor's and Florida International University. Yeah. And again, starting from scratch. Again. Yeah. It's like, God, this is the third time. And the same yeah. thing was happening to me. At this point, I already had the Miami accent down packed. So I sounded like I was from here, born and raised. So I thought that I already like I removed that issue. But a yeah. lot of the kids that were there, they were either I, I was coming in as a junior, it's a transfer. So the okay. juniors already had their friends. Like yeah. all organizations, they've already been together for two and a half years. Yeah. Um, the, the other transfers, they were like, they had the mentality of, I come from a community college, going to class, go home, go to class, go home, get my degree, go to work. I wanted the American college experience. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then that's when I realized that there were some guys from some of the fraternities that yeah. they were making fun of me because I was trying to be too involved or... Huh. I didn't want to play in intramurals. And I was like, no, 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 no. This yeah. crap is not going to happen to me. I'm not yeah. in the sixth grade. You're not going to make fun of me for not wanting to play sports. You're not going to make fun of me for not wanting to join specific groups. So I did what I do best, Cliff, like you said, like competitive. And I joined <laughs> everything. I went to overdrive. <laughs> I rushed the fraternity. I joined the homecoming council. I was organizing stuff I with the SGA. Like I joined everything that I could because I came with a formula and I said, it worked for me twice before. It's going to work again. And yeah. I had that college experience that you have somewhere else. FIU at that time was not the university to go to. It was like, okay. if you get rejected everywhere else, you go to FIU. And in okay. Miami Dade, they will tell you, transfer to Harvard, transfer to NYU, transfer to USC. And I did my bookworm friends. They started kind of teasing me for staying behind at FIU. 
instead of going away. I have to explain and defend my decision that I'm already away from home. Yeah. I'm already away from my second home. I'm across the country from California. I'm across the Caribbean from my home home in Venezuela. Why yeah. do I need to be moving again? I can just stay in Miami. Whenever all my friends from, F- from Miami Dade, they will come back for the holidays to visit their families. I'm here. I have my apartment. They can come hang out with me. I don't sure. have to be that person that goes away again. So then they started saying, oh, you're only saying that because you didn't get into anywhere else. And that's why my parents are always so proud to say that I got into all the universities I applied to because I yeah. applied top tier universities and I got mm-hmm. in and I got scholarships, but I decided to stay in Miami. I already, I was building my professional network. I was building, you know, that communications and PR, I guess, you know, circle. Well, and talk about your teacher that you met through FIU. Yeah. So in Miami, Dade, I started as a civil engineering uh, major and I wanted to get a master's in architecture. That was my plan since I was five. <laughs> that was the roadmap that my parents did for me as well. So when when I go into FIU, into Miami Dade, and I start realizing that, you know, I don't enjoy math as much. And I realized that this friendly, rambunctious, charismatic personality that I have developed, that can serve me a purpose. It can serve a purpose beyond me just making friends and beyond me arming myself with a shield and army of people to protect me from being teased or bullied. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I And I started telling my friends I want to change majors. Um, I didn't know what it was. But then uh, when I was taking English too, um, my teacher, uh, the professor, uh, Professor Greenberg, she told us the first time she was tough. She was really tough. Like she gave me several C's in my papers. <laughs> um, and you weren't used to that, obviously. You'd been doing so well. I was used to getting A's, straight A's, yeah. 195s. That's it. Not even an A minus would feel like a dagger in my heart. So I started <laughs> getting C's. Um, but then so she, she woke me up. Yeah. And then again, that competition. She told me more than once, I'm like, you need to improve your grammar. You need to improve how you present things. Your syntax is off. You're using a positives when you shouldn't be using a positives. You shouldn't be putting commas here. Like she was marking my papers that they were bleeding red with ink. <laughs> and it made me want to be better. But then she made that class so interesting. She, it was um, literature and science fiction. And huh. I didn't know I liked science fiction up until that point. I did like, you know, Harry Potter and like fantasy stuff and like, you know, Halo, all of these like futuristic novels. And then I started to develop such a good interest in writing the reports from the books and the short stories we were reading. And I was learning like so many words in the vocabulary. And I was pushed so hard by her to actually improve my writing that I, I realized at the end, it's like, I'm pretty darn good at this. And my friends would come to me. They were like native English speakers. They would come to me to edit their papers. Yeah. And that's when I went to another, another class after, and it was a speech class and I was writing all the speeches and the teacher told me, it's like, you know, your grammar is so much more polished because you learned English from the ground up. You didn't learn English by speaking and then going to class. You had to learn it from the first letters to the, context from the grammar everything and that kind of gave me the confidence that i can do i can do i can i can perform a career not in science and math but in languages there's a good message there that i don't want people watching this to listen to uh to to miss and did you pick up that too i, know I picked up a bunch of messages it, yeah. <laughs> and, and so i'm gonna say this and then go ahead yeah. but uh I really want people to understand that don't be afraid to try something new because it's like you're saying, you know, it's like sometimes when you don't have those bad habits, you know, you can actually build and become better at it than other people can that are trying to break these bad habits. So really key in all that to me was like, don't be afraid to try something new because you think you're going to be bad at it because look at what can happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or even when as far as you had a perspective. You know, she challenged you. Yeah. And right. I know, like, I love that you're a competitor because every time you bring it up, I like chills go down my spine. That's how I am. <laughs> I, I like competing and uh, competing should be healthy. 
and yeah. fun. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that's, right. The, that's the kind of com- competition I do. It's not like I'm better than someone. No, I like to collaborate with people. And if I have a teacher who's going to challenge me in a completely different way because they know that I can do better or or you can use it with anger, too. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. say like, hey, they're going to hate on me. I'll show them. Yeah. yeah. Use it however you need to use it to get to the result. Best so damn writer it. ever. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I percent. Well, and by the way, since we have, you know, uh, entrepreneurship is like the thing these days, right? Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to tell the audience what I think is the most important skill in entrepreneurship. And I don't have it. And that's writing. Written communication is everything these days. You know, absolutely. I mean, when you're talking about content marketing, when you're talking about even sending sales emails, or even an email to a new supplier, whatever it is, it's writing. You know, and I actually talked to the uh, president of Maricopa Community College. It's our community college system. We happen to sit yeah. each other, next to each other in a city council meeting. She's like, what's the important, most important skill in entrepreneurship? I'm like, writing, hands down. I wish I had tried harder in high school because you really have to build that skill like young. You know, I still work on it every single day. But right. it is so important, writing, yeah. entrepreneurship. I, I, I'm I, I love this. So I... I Rafael, I'd like to hear your answer. To the, the biggest, the, the best skill the for doing entrepreneurship? For an entrepreneur, yeah. yeah. Uh, writing. <laughs> uh, writing is like number one. I would say, I would say that it's tied with, uh, I guess like, I don't, I really don't know how to, how to put it, but it would be that fearlessness. Yeah. yeah. Like you have to be confident that even if you mess up, everything will be okay. Like, yeah. like I would phrase that in a different way. Yeah. Like, Please do. so writing, I think is the skill, the trait, let's say yeah. is never giving up. I Absolutely. don't care what business you start out there today. If you don't give up, I can almost promise you success. Get hit in the face a bunch, you know, keep walking forward and you won't fail. Now I say that and then like there's somebody that gets sued or something like that. But so take that with a grain of soul, you know, because I've been through it all. But keep walking well, and, forward. And, you know, one thing that I learned because I, I don't mention it a lot, but I did at some point start a marketing and PR little side agency with one of my friends. And mm-hmm. it was it went well for about a year and a half or two years. We had some clients, you know, we had a couple of interns, we had an employee, but then it started going down and we said, you know, we were able to recognize that that was not our calling. We couldn't yeah. sell ourselves, manage the agency and manage our clients. It, we, we were not cut out for that. And that's okay. It took me years to realize that it's okay to fail sometimes because it wasn't a complete failure because we cut it and we stopped it before we failed. That we finished the clients, we finished the contract. And we told our clients, hey, we're not renewing because we're, we're going to, you know, shut down. And we, you know, wrote their contracts up until the end. And that's it. We walked away. We learned. And we learned about ourselves. We learned about each other. We learned about our skills. And it made me realize, if I'm going to open another agency, which I'm never going to do, <laughs> I know what <laughs> I'm going to do and how and, and, you know, how to do it well. That's why when I did my entrepreneur, you know, little uh, journey, it was not with PR. It was with a catering business with my family. So it's an excellent point. And I'm just going to weigh in on this because entrepreneurship is a huge passion of mine, you know, and I do a lot of consulting these days. I talk to a lot of new business owners or would be new business owners. And one of the things is people will say, I don't know which of these 10 ideas I want. Right. And I've really, and this took me a year of reflection after selling my last business. I've been involved with several, but really my last business was the one that taught me this lesson is Grit and never quitting is the most important trait, right? Like I said, this can also be dangerous in a way too, because if you start something that isn't in alignment with your mind, your heart, who you are, then you will continue no matter how much that's taking you off track of what you want to do in life or who you want to be. So I tell people first, explore here. You know, what is it that feels like good work? Steve Jobs said that, you know, the best way to be fulfilled is to do good work. I'm not saying love every part of business because business is hard. I'm saying you have to do something that you feel is good work. And you also have to do something that aligns to your futuristic goals, right? So if you're opening a business that doesn't align someday to your future goals or what you have in your heart as good work, then 
find another business. Don't get into business just to get into business. There's easier ways to make money, right? So I try not to derail too much, but this is a lot of what I talk about these days and talk to people about is assessing your business first in this way. And then we go into business plans and I've developed this thing called a plan for business. And then we go into planning phase, variable costs, fixed costs, that sort of thing, and make sure it has legs. But first here, right? Right. Like anything else in life, you're writing, you know, like you loved it first, you know, like you had a passion for dancing that got you here, you know? And yeah. that's right. Like, I, I look, I love this. I'm loving this conversation. And uh, the most important thing an entrepreneur for me is uh, relationships. That's I think relationship too. is the most important thing because if I was looking at someone like you, Raphael, who has an amazing writing ability, who has a skill set, now I just need to figure out the, the why and the what behind right. you getting behind me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because you have years and years, like this, this is the beauty of the, the bully, this journey, I think, is kids know that you're accumulating skill sets yep. right now when you're putting in the reps. When it's hard, you're putting in reps. Yep. And sometimes we just don't know we're putting in reps. We're putting in reps and, and we start putting in so many reps after a while and we look back like, holy crap, I'm a badass. Yeah, <laughs> you're connecting yeah. the dots. You know, most of my life, I was a full-time worker, full-time student. Do you know how perfectly that prepared me to be an entrepreneur? 100%. The hours, you know, you put full-time student, full-time work and homework. And that's pretty much what an entrepreneur's hours are. So little did I know it, I was built for this schedule. You know, it's no problem for me. The hours are easy. So you're building these things in your life. You don't even know what you're building towards. And like Cliff said, you're putting in the reps. You know, you're putting in the reps each time and it's going to pay off in the future. You thank yourself. Your four year future self thanks you now for putting this work in. 100 percent. Yeah. And yeah, it, like you said, Cliff, like, I mean, all of these experiences, when I started looking into them and I, I, which happened, I guess, because of the pandemic, extra free time, locked up at mm-hmm. home, uh, I started thinking and I, and I did realize I'm like, I am a badass. I am. Yeah. Say, yeah. I Own can it. do anything. And. So what my my mom said it one time. She's like, anything I touch turns to gold. Not everything, but I mean, I I took it with a grain of salt. I'm like, you know what? That's not. It, it's not just because like I have the Midas to touch. It's because I have the perseverance. I have that that you know solutions oriented mindset. It's like, okay, yeah. let me grab this. What can we do to make it better? What are the issues that he has? Let's make it better. And then again, yeah. I apply my writing. I apply that creative uh, sense that I have into making it like, let's take it to the next level. Let's fix what's broken and whatever's mm-hmm. working, just leave it work. Just don't, don't fix it unless it's broken. And then you can go make it better when everything else goes. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's why it's so important to find that confidence in something because that starts to build. You know, yep. that that initial confidence in something like your dance starts to build into something else like your writing starts to build into something. Else. Look at Elon Musk. Great example. Oh, yeah. Kid, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, thrown down the stairs. I would have liked to talk to uh, Elon of 20 years ago because I guarantee the man is the flip side of who he is now. There is no part of doubt in Elon anymore. He's built himself. Right from that. So it's almost like he got torn down completely and rebuilt kind of like you're talking, you know, into this entrepreneur that completely believes in himself. And that and he's not only he's so convincing that he believes in himself, he believes other people believe him too. Right? That's why they invest in his companies, even though they're losing money. (laughs) (laughs) But They continue to do it. Right? 100%. So let's, uh, let's talk. Um, a little bit about what you're doing today and how you've utilized, you know, some of that path that you've had and what's next for you. Right. So right now, I mean, today I work in PR. I mean, I've, I've always worked in public relations and marketing communications. I'm at this amazing firm, Sax Media. Um, you know, I have incredible mentors, I have incredible uh, co-workers. And I started working in the beginning of the pandemic. I actually got laid off at the beginning of the pandemic. And as, as the shutdown was happening, I got my job offer and I started working from home, which was, you know, new company, new coworkers, new clients, new environments, yeah. new, new again, everything. <laughs> but um, yeah. 
Right. And then I, <laughs> what, what I, I mean, I want to give them a shout out because I've I always told all my friends, my family, everybody, it's like I've never worked at a place with people that are so talented. Like they are awesome. everyone I'm working with are so smart that I need to bring my A game, the competition cliff again. It's like I cannot be the less or like the, the, the less performing professional at the firm. So mm-hmm. I am pushing myself oh, harder than I can. So then they they know it's like my, my supervisor, uh, Ryan, he calls it the spice. Like there's a spice that I bring. And it's that competitive advantage that I have. It's like I want to compete. I want to be the best from all the yeah. managers at the firm. And yep. with my clients, if they have other partner agencies, I want them to see us as the best agency from the ones that they, they're working with. It's yeah. That competitiveness. Um, and then on top of that, um, I help my mom and my dad uh, lead this successful catering business. It's the family business. It's um, it's incredible. They are in their 60s. And mind you, they came here to retire and then they were going crazy. So we opened this. Yeah. Business. <laughs> and they have, my mind you, my mom, she's, she, was a, she was a healthcare worker, retired. My dad is an attorney, retired. And they're cooking. And to them, for me to see them being 65 and 60, 66 and 67, um, and they're working just as hard as I am or harder sometimes, yeah. and see them really put their effort, and people undermine them. A lot of the people that hire them, you know, the the, service, the food service industry, a lot of people look down uh, you know, on the, on the workers. They think that they're just someone that couldn't make anything else. They don't realize that my mom and my dad are the owners of this business, and they're cooking yeah. because of their passion. And yeah. they're retired professionals that they spent yeah. years studying. Um, yeah. And then when they tell them, they're like, oh, my God, like, couldn't believe it because the food tastes as if you've been cooking for 60 years. So, yeah. you know, I guess I keep learning from them well, that no job is beneath you ever. No. And I mean, look, at that's a form of bullying. They're experiencing it now, you know, yeah. and that's really too bad. I mean, one of the things that we used to do in my last business until the very end is uh, we took turns cleaning the employee restroom, including myself. I had guys that make six figure incomes. They would take a turn in cleaning the employee restroom. And if you can make a job like that, and I know that sounds kind of silly, but if you can make a job like that to try to do it as good as possible, because it became a competition, right? We would all clean that restroom. Like I I couldn't be outdone. I'm the CEO of the company, but at the same time, you never know who's watching you or what effect that had. And what I realized down the road, not at the time. So we had a new guy come in and he's complaining about having to sweep the floors. And one of the managers goes, you know what? If the CEO of the company can come over here and clean the restroom, you can sweep the floors. So it builds this respect, right? This work ethic. And I, I'm not too good to clean the restroom. I should still do it. You know, if I have a billion dollar company someday, I hope I'm still doing it, you know? And so, and not only that, but let's say the guy's whole job is to clean the restroom. Who are you to get down on him? Because that's his job. And most of the time, somebody that wants to get down on somebody like that has had everything handed to him in life. Yep. Right. To get to that moment. And if this person's out there in a thankless job doing the hard work, you know, and you have no right to treat them any other way, it's another form of bullying. I digress, but it's, it's important to me that people yeah. understand that. Yeah. You know, it's and you know what? Oh, of, uh, of Jesus Christ when he would wash the feet of uh, his followers and, and just saying like, there is no job beneath you. And it actually when a respectable person can do certain jobs, it reminds everybody that the job's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every job is important in your company. Every job's important. You know, I mean, look at, I I actually, I don't remember if this is a true story or not, but I heard the janitor from Cheetos invented flaming hot Cheetos and uh, interdisciplinary thought. The good idea can come from anywhere, you know, and I I think people need to think about that more in their companies. You know, you never know if the idea comes from your secretary. You never know if your idea comes from the person cleaning the bathroom. The idea can come from anywhere. And it's based on where did their mind come from? Where did their learning come from? Where did their, what was their background? So explore, immerse, find things because you never know what problem that's going to solve at some point. Yeah. And Tyler, to that point, maybe this is not for the podcast, but just for your own reference, there's a company called um, Ageless Innovation. They're, um, mm-hmm. They started as, a, as an arm of Hasbro, the toy maker. 
and then now oh, they're, cool. they're on company. Uh, I produce a podcast for, for work for a client of ours. And yeah. the, the CEO of the Intermountain Healthcare, he interviewed the CEO of um, Ageless Innovation. They host, or they, they started in 2020, but then they had to shut it down. But they're hosting uh, like a think tank almost. They they basically create products like um, like toy pets for the elderly so that you can help them with dementia and like loneliness and anxiety oh, and that's they're awesome. hosting, yeah they're hosting think tanks with the elderly customers that they have to see what ideas they have for the fellow older adults and this lady right. came up with one idea it's like for them not to to forget to use their walkers like a little birdie that goes on the walker and then if if it sends it like i don't i really don't know the details but it's so cool because what you're saying it's like the ideas could come from the janitor, from the secretary, or from the customers. And as long as you're yeah. willing to listen, that's the best leadership or entrepreneurial trait that you can have also. You need to be willing to listen. And yeah. going back to that silo, we get siloed in our own worlds, right? We forget yeah. that outside opinions can actually be the best way to fix a problem or to address a problem at times. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. love it. And now going back to, you know, the, the topic in hand, uh, you know, part of what I'm doing today is like in in, in I've always been behind the behind the, the scenes. I'm I'm behind the camera, behind the mic, like I'm in the production table. I'm editing the stuff. I'm telling the people what to do, what to say. I'm writing the scripts. I'm not reading the script myself. And this last year, that's when I decided to start my podcast. I've always wanted to to have a podcast or a radio show. My dad had a radio yeah. show, and but then I had that little sliver oh. of uh that that the sliver of of lack of confidence of, yeah. that was ingrained from that time in high school. And then from the second high school and then from college and all of those little like scars, I guess. And after I talked to my friend, like I told you, and I realized kind of put all the pieces together that it was it was just in my head. I realized that I'm way too much into my head. <laughs> like I need to get out of my head. I overthink yeah. things. I overproduced myself. And yeah. And I said, you know what? If podcasting is going to be cool for me and like it's going to be good for my men mental health because i want to be i want to have fun with it i talked to my yeah. supervisors i produced and pr'd myself and i I put the boundaries of what's going to be acceptable and not because my podcast is nothing like yours <laughs> it's, okay. it's, not a profession. it's nothing it's a mess it's chaotic mess yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like a fest like rough from california it's like the crazy yeah. stories that i don't tell people um, yeah. I found an amazing co-host who's a friend of mine now. We became like, she's like my little sister now. And she balances me out. You know, she's like the, the yin to the yang, like the female energy to the podcast instead of my craziness. And, yeah. and I said, you know what? F it. Let's do it. And, Good for you. Right. And that happens. Like, that, I think that's so important. And it's a message that I've, I've told people. Like, I've known um, my friend's nieces. She's an inc one of them is an incredible drawer. Like she like her drawings can be an anime series or a manga series. Like it's at that level of perfection that she does. The other one is an incredible singer that can rival Billie Eilish. They're yeah. so concerned of what people are going to think that they're not posting it out there. I was like post post it on TikTok, post it on Instagram. So is it sad. I it mean it's really sad. Cliff and I, well, Cliff doesn't regret anything, I don't think, in life. Cliff, really. Cliff and that's, <laughs> you're talking about yin and yang. We're a good balance that way because I fear this immensely. This this podcast thing, for me, I'm approaching one of my biggest fears in life, you know, to do this. You Love know, it. every time we're having an episode, believe it or not, I'm nervous, you know, and like, I and like, and it's such a he uh, heavy subject too. You feel like you have to do a good job. Believe it or not, you know, I have to read the intro still, but I practice the intro about 70 times a night and I film oh, myself doing it and I rewind it and do it again, you know, because I feel like I owe it to you. You're sharing your story. I feel like I owe it to the kids who are hopefully getting something out of this, you know, and then I owe it to myself to do the best job I possibly can. And even if I still have to come in here and read it a little bit, you know, then I've at least I put every effort into doing it right. And, uh, and, and approach a fear, you know, which is what we're doing and, and hopefully we make some impact from it. Your story. So incredible. Like I feel like almost cliff that like, it almost should be turned into a movie and therefore that movie <laughs> should be given to all kids that are bullied because he like literally right. textbook ways of dealing with stuff, textbook journey ending, you know, well, we're not at the end yet, but the end of our story, you know, uh, with you is, is a great finale. I mean, look what you're doing, you know? So I'm, I'm really impressed with everything you've done. I, I love the way you've taken this, 
this thing that was hard and you've continually progressed your life and you continually built, you know, more. And you were the new guy, just like Eminem. And you turned that new guy into something good. And you started over and learned to do things like writing that weren't in your first primary skill set and became amazing at them. Yep. Cliff, I'd love to hear what else you have to say on this. Uh, Raphael, thank you for your amazing story. Um, you've had so many trials, so many tribulations, and you continue to have them. You know, you said, yeah. I'm going to do I'm going to do my own podcast. And I was uh, I was a little bit nervous to do it. And even though I, I live with no regrets and there's reasons behind that, I'll get into that at another time. But um, I still have fear just like anybody else. Yeah. And it's the action. We just act through it. Yeah. Right. And we learn the lessons along the way and we get better and better at doing it. And you even mentioned on a on a piece where you said you didn't know who those people were. You didn't know who the people who were going to be on your side. And you just kept acting, though. You kept taking action. You kept doing what you needed to do. Yep. And you were adjusting and you were measuring. You were measuring everything like, OK, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe yeah. this. No, oh, yeah. oh, here it is. Uh-huh. Here it is. Oh, I'm hitting it. Yep. <laughs> and you find your stride and you just go. And I, I mean, that excites me. That excites me, and I, I'm sure it will excite uh, any kid going through whatever they're going through to spread their wings. So thank you. Of course. Thank you for having me. This has been an awesome conversation. No, no kidding. It's went by so fast. We're actually a little, a little over time right now. But thank you so much for coming. I'm going to wrap us up here. So thank you once again, audience, for coming to another episode of Bully This, A Hero's Journey. Cliff and I love doing this for you. Um, and thanks for continuing to allow it. I keep missing this. And this is awful of me. I also got to thank our producers, uh, Elliot and Kelly. Um, thank the guys at the studio here for their help. You know, we'll be back next week uh, with another journey. See you then. Take care, everyone. You've been listening to Bully This, A Hero's Journey. The effects on kids that are bullied are many. Increased risk for depression, anxiety, sleep difficulties, lower grades, and dropping out of school. It's a real problem, and that's why we created this show. We're acutely aware of the pain, shame, and damage that bullying causes, and our passion is to help kids and families to know that there is always help, that there is always a solution. We hope you've gotten some useful information from the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on Facebook at Bully This, A Hero's Journey. Take care, and we'll see you next time.